stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. We share stories for many reasons, to persuade, to entertain, to connect. What we sometimes forget is the impact of the stories we tell ourselves. Whether you're sharing personal stories or business stories, how you share them makes a difference in how you remember them and in how you're perceived by the people you're interacting with. When you figure out which stories to share, difficult bosses and coworkers, successes, failures, the next step is to develop how you share them. Have you figured out your patterns, your roles in those successes, the discomfort and your challenges? In this series, you'll hear stories that will resonate with you. You'll nod your head in understanding, and then we'll dig into the lessons from each of those. How many times have you been sharing a story only to be interrupted by a person eager to share his own? When I'm working with clients on communication skills, I remind them to listen for understanding, not to respond. But during this podcast, I'm asking you to listen and consider your own related stories, to listen and consider which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. Welcome to the podcast, Marilyn. This is such a treat to be able to talk to you about some of the stories that we've kind of touched on in our conversations over the past couple of weeks. So thank you for agreeing to be on my podcast. Thank you so much to, for having me. So I just want to introduce you briefly. My friend Neil Hughes uh, suggested that we connect, and I thought our listeners would appreciate kind of how these things happen with, with, at least with my podcast, I'm assuming it happens with others. When one of my friends gets introduced to somebody, they hear certain stories that resonate with them and they immediately reach out to me and say, oh my gosh, you have to interview this person because they had such great stories. And you were one of those people that Neil reached out to me about and said, I think you and Marilyn will really connect. So um, here's, here's an introduction and go with it, whatever happens. Well, do you remember I, I, that? I do remember this. And I think that Neil introduced us, now that I know you a little bit more, because we are fairly spontaneous. <laughs> fairly spontaneous, <laughs> which sometimes looks like impulsive, but... <laughs> no, but like- no, no, it's, we're spontaneous and we speak our mind and uh, we are able to tell a story, but deviate from the story and uh, have a kind of a free-spirited approach to talking. I bet you're right. And I bet he didn't even consciously put that together. He just heard it <laughs> and, and went with his instincts because he, he has really good instincts. Well, he has good instincts because he has a lot of knowledge. Yes, yes. And, and he listens really well. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm going to jump right into the first question because um, I always ask my guests a question I asked them to tell us something about themselves that most people wouldn't know, that wouldn't be on your resume or your bio. And it's partly because I, when we start talking about really personal stories, I like our listeners to have a little bit of context and, and sense a bit of your personality. And asking that question always brings out some personality. So what do you think? You know, most people don't really know uh, that when you are French, you are not necessarily necessarily from Paris. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. That's true. Uh, even though I studied in Paris, originally I was born in um, Brittany, which is the western part of France, kind of facing Cornwall, uh, the British, uh, the, the the United Kingdom, and my parents were school teachers in, uh, in, literally in the boonies, where, I mean, they had to teach kids whose parents didn't want that they would go to school, because those kids were designed almost by their parents to become farmers themselves. So they didn't like my parents. Uh, they didn't like the fact that my parents would insist that uh, all the kids would go to school. And I really, I remember, as far as my memory starts, I remember the determination of my parents to make sure that all the kids would go to school. And I also admire my parents for teaching them things they had no idea existed. So my parents would speak of uh, travel, of music, of the arts, and this in a very rural environment. And they got all these kids interested, so much so that the kids were fighting their parents to be able to go to school. Wow. So, and 
And what really was key in my childhood was to see the confidence that my parents had in the ability for people to learn and to like learning. And this has been part of me since I was, what, three or four, basically. Wow. Now, this, this was very important for me when I became a teacher myself. I used to teach philosophy. And this became even more important when I started my first tech company because I wanted my employees to love the company and love the job. That's why I wrote a book, Everybody Wants to Love the Job. Mm -hmm. And this really is totally part of who I am. Well, that's what I was going to say is um, that whole concept of trusting and having the confidence that the people around you actually want to learn. That, um, it, that, that theme runs all through your book, and it's actually a big part of what Guy Kawasaki said in his introduction of your book, which was that you don't necessarily want people in your startup or in any organization that you're hiring, you don't necessarily want them to know everything at the beginning. You don't want them to have the laundry list of skills because you want them to be hungry to learn and you want to help them learn. Yes, and this is really uh, the way I was hiring myself. I would look at people, uh, look for people who had minimal skill to be useful right away. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I trusted them to learn, they would. And frankly, after 30 years of um, being CEO, it has always been true. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And the, because the important thing is, when you hire people for their existing skills, they tend to fill a hole and stay in their hole. And when mm -hmm. they are sick and tired of being in their hole, they want to quit. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Right, because they don't see any other way out. They don't see any other way out, and they they lose the ability, to de even the desire to learn. When you hire people more strategically for their potential, they all of a sudden become very confident of who they can become. And they're not afraid to say, to tell you after say 18 months that they are a little bored with what they are doing. So mm -hmm. uh, then you are also as a boss far more open to help them evolve. Right. Uh, so as a result, you can keep your employees much much longer, and you build the bedrock of a true company culture. Mm -hmm. Of engagement, a culture of engagement and curiosity. Yes, and of commitment to mm -hmm. the message, uh, to the mission of the company. Right, and that all is sourced from your experience watching your parents engage with those students and know that they had the capacity to be curious and to learn, and, and the desire as long as it was presented them, to them in a way that made sense to them. Yes. And this wow. was really totally key. And Did then, your parents know that? Yes. I mean, it was really part of the culture of my family in a way. And the, the first week I was teaching philosophy, uh, my students were a little bored. And my sister said, well, if you start to be like any other professor of philosophy, your students are going to be bored the way you were bored. Okay? And, <laughs> and then I changed. And I, I went back to my roots uh, and I became more spontaneous. And I, instead of assuming that philosophy would be difficult because it's a very, very difficult discipline, I, um, I assumed, no, it was not difficult if you believe that people could learn. And instead of explaining that Plato was great, uh, because, you know, when you're told when you're 18 that Plato is great, you say, come on, okay, <laughs> you want to, to be skeptical. When right. you tell them to read a big book like The Republic, which is one of the major texts by Plato, uh, mm -hmm. as a sort of uh, theater uh, play, okay, where you have uh, Greek people uh, fighting over words, 
they get they are amused, so they read it, and actually they absorb the message very spontaneously. Usually, when you are told that things are deep, you don't want to hear about them. When you are told that things are interesting and funny, you are more curious. Right, right, yeah. and it again, it it all comes down to how you present the information to them, and yes. and instead of telling them what it is. Letting them figure that out for themselves. Yes, and it's uh, much easier. So I, I'm imagining you teaching philosophy to um, a room full of students who are bored out of their minds. Do you have a, a vivid memory of any time in that classroom when you noticed things changed? Things changed when I didn't try to teach them directly when uh, the thing changed when I started to listen to them. So what I did is instead of saying, this is uh, what uh, language is about, for example, you know, Mm -hmm. big session about language. Uh, Instead of uh, starting of what I was thinking, I would have the students think for some time, half an hour, about what language was for them. And then based on all the feedback they would give to me, and at the time the classrooms were pretty big, it was about 30 students, Mm -hmm. uh, build an entire story based on what they had said. So Mm -hmm. it required for me a big capability to adjust, but this is where I really learn how, what attunement is. what understanding others is about if you want others to understand you. So was there any one student that stood out to you in that first time when you started to change the way that your methodology of teaching? They were a little bit uh, disconcerted because no, no other teacher was doing, that, doing it this right. way. <laughs> right. So I'm sure the majority of the students were puzzled no, by it. And so they, they literally clammed up. I mean... Uh, right. Actually, did uh, any stand up? Did any of them like stop and go, whoa, this is cool and start to work with you? No, I mean, I did not call for this kind of praise. Uh, it really, the very beginning, it was, you know, there was this uh, awkward five, ten minutes of silence. <laughs> but uh-huh. I was not afraid of silence. So statistically, more people were afraid of silence than I was. So, <laughs> right. So, so someone was going to speak. Absolutely. And <laughs> most of the time, uh, people are afraid of silence. And I decided not to be afraid because I knew that this was very unusual for them and that they, they were afraid. And if, if you tell people, speak up, speak, you are so authoritarian that people clam, uh, don't right. want to speak even, I mean, they are still more afraid to speak. So silence is the best way to tell people speak up. Right. That's and and it's partly out of fear because there are people who are so uncomfortable with that silence. They feel like they need to fill it. And it's usually the people who are kind of the class clowns, the people who yeah. um, they they are uncomfortable in their heads, and so they get louder out, outside. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, but this is not what I experienced. The people who started to speak were, um, I mean, there was no specific characteristic of the people who started to speak. Huh. Um, it was maybe more um, people who would, would have been socially shy and who felt that it was not kind to me to let silence continue. Oh, wow. Somebody it, considerate. Yes. And thoughtful. Yes. Uh, politeness is actually an excellent reason to speak. And when you let people talk, you realize that the uh, big mouth are not necessarily the first one to talk. The big mouths usually chime in to say, I agree, or even more frequently, I disagree. Uh, But when you have a big crowd, 
it's not necessarily the adventurous, the, uh, uh, I have not observed that there would be a specific profile. What I've seen most are people who are simply kind and don't want to let people alone. Just like in a party, when you go in a party, um, somebody can come to you if you are by yourself. It doesn't mean that this is the most social person on the planet. Uh, They're just this, considerate and they, they see a discomfort and want to... Yes, and want to help. Help. Huh. Yes. And I, bet, I bet you use that in your meetings, the silence. Um, often, yes. <laughs> I'm going to have to find a way to incorporate that into my work. That's great. And then I'll start really observing who speaks up. And oh, that's interesting. Better. You cannot project a very specific profile. Literally. Right. Yeah. Right. So this, we actually dove right into the topic that I wanted to, to really um, explore with you for this podcast episode, which is taking risks and um, really the, the way that you perceive taking risk. And because it's so different, and we've talked a couple times about this offline, but this, this fits right into that theme because as you were talking about you're teaching in that philosophy class and choosing to switch direction and try something completely different in getting them engaged right away and asking them what they thought language was. I'm sure to many people that would have been considered a risk that you were taking. But to you, that, that didn't feel like risk, right? No, no. And actually, I have a hard time <laughs> evaluating the notion of taking risk. Uh, each time some, somebody tells me that, well, I, I have to take this risk or uh, I'm not a risk taker, I wonder what they mean, okay? And what I observe is that the people who are telling me that they were risk takers would say this because they had succeeded. So the danger was out of the picture, Okay, okay. And so a lot of people who tell you that they are risk takers uh, are basically uh, flattering themselves <laughs> or expect to be lauded for something they perceive uh, as something great they did, okay? Uh, when it, and so they, they feel that the perceived risk is going to glorify who they are, and huh. that they will sound, they will look uh, better than who they are. So it's, it's like people telling you they're smart. Oh, Don't tell me you're smart, demonstrate it. Okay. If, you, if you're telling people you're a great leader, then you're probably missing something. Exactly. So it's, uh, I was always a little uh, suspicious. I had more respect for people who would tell me that they were afraid of taking the risk um, right. because then I could tell them that there is not much risk to take uh, and be reassuring and explain that in a given situation when we have to make a decision, um, we have to get knowledge of all the possible causal relationship between things we have to assess the probabilities uh, on, and how probabilities pan out. And in fact, it's also um, a good way to reassure people that you have the means to acquire the knowledge to have control over your existence or create new things. And so you are afraid to, be, to take risk, but come on. You are here where you are because at some point you exercise your freedom. And anything we do in that case is risk, whether we are consciously thinking of it or not. So you don't need to be a risk taker to do great things. <laughs> I, I love that because it, it is something that I've talked to some of my coaching clients about in terms of their fear of taking a step or, or taking a chance or doing something that's out of their comfort zone. Or I just had this conversation with a friend. Uh, it was probably a year ago when I started thinking this through after this conversation. 
she was getting ready to travel and she was very nervous about this traveling. And I, I said, what are you nervous about? She said, well, all the things that could go wrong. And I said, like what? She said, like losing my luggage or getting stuck overnight or, you know, having, having trouble with the, the plane or whatever. And I said, you've traveled a lot. She said, yeah. And I said, so why are you so nervous about traveling? She said, well, because I know all the things that can go wrong. And I said, well, that's actually a benefit that you already yeah, know cool. what could go wrong. Yeah. And I said, I said, so um, have, you, have they lost your luggage before when you've been traveling for work? She said, yes. And I said, oh, it must have been awful for you. Uh-huh. And she said, well, it wasn't that bad. I mean, they delivered it the next day and I was able to go to Target and get some clean underwear. And I said, oh, okay. Um, have you missed a flight and then been stuck, you know, stranded at an airport overnight? She said, yes. And I said, oh, that must have been so awful for you. Yeah. And she said, well, actually, I met this really neat woman that night and we're still in touch. And, and you know, it wasn't so bad. And I said, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> and, <laughs> I said, so you handled each of these obstacles, these challenges as they came up. Yeah. You just handled them. You just dealt with it. You figured out a way to get through it, right? She said, yes. And I said, so basically, if you look forward at these things that you're afraid of or that you're afraid to take a risk in, think about all the evidence you have from the previous few years that prove to you that you can do it, that yeah. you've gotten through this before, that you can get through it again. So I said, from now on, when you start feeling that anxiety, Start a sentence. All evidence points to. Yeah, all my knowledge points to. Okay. Exactly. All, all the evidence of my previous experience points to the fact that I can handle this. I can do this <laughs> again. And, and I'll do it even better because I have this experience. And she just laughed. And I ended up talking to her about a week after her trip. I said, how did it go? Did they lose any of your luggage? Was it horrible? She said, no, everything was fine. <laughs> no, and... And in fact, when you build the landscape of everything that can go wrong, uh, so it's fine. But in practice, what the probability that something will go wrong is something that you have not anticipated. Right. (laughs) For example, (laughs) I'm thinking thinking of uh, explorers. You know, Dumont d'Urville was a very famous French explorer of the 19th century. And uh, he discovered Adélie Land, which is part of Antarctica, and they have a station there, okay? Uh-huh. So he, the probability for him to die in a boat uh, facing all the dangers of treacherous, uh, treacherous seas was very, very high. But guess right. what? He died in a stupid train accident in the suburbs of Paris, okay? <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't laugh because it's sad. That's, but it's, that's it's, right. So uh, a high probability, uh, a low probability of something to occur doesn't mean that it won't occur, okay? Right. And the high probability that something will occur doesn't mean that it will occur. <laughs> I, <laughs> right. So tell me a time that that happened to you, that you had kind of all your ducks in a row. You, you knew what the obstacles were. You knew how you would handle them. And then something completely shifted. And what happened was nothing you could have predicted. Do you have a specific story about that? I do not have a very specific story about this because I always, when I mean, in terms of business, uh, when I had a certitude about a certainty about something, I was always naturally making sure that people around me would really track all the reasons of uncertainty. So I was always very open to uncertainty and to changing, readjusting almost in real time, continuously all the time. So you were doing Agile before Agile existed? Definitely. (laughs) Right. Definitely. Uh, because I trusted the feedback of my employees. So, um, you know, if somebody in tech support was uh, speaking of a bug, I would never dismiss it. 
uh, and I would consider that even a small bug was important for one customer. So this was, and some people were not afraid to tell me if there was an issue. That really was key to my way to manage. Mm-hmm. And I'm finally, I mean, I'm not thinking in terms of risk, but there is one thing I'm comfortable with uncertainty. Oh, uh, right. Uh, and because uncertainty is a sense of uncertainty is also the ability to address issues, to, but to go further than what you think in the first place. You know? I think to be comfortable with uncertainty, you have to be confident with your previous experience. Or you are also to have the confidence in others. As a, as a rule, we always look at the world from our own solipsist, personal right. standpoint, when in reality we live with other people. And so if I felt more nervous, if everything was honky-dory for several days, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I had to that everybody was on vacation because it was almost an illusion. It's too quiet. It's, it's, it's when you hear the drum beat, you're like, I wish they'd yeah. stop those stupid drums. And then you, they stop and you're like, what happened to the drums? Yes. <laughs> um, but when you like to live, uh, when, when you accept that we live with others and they notice things, um, you, you basically crowdsource intelligence all the time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the level of uncertainty is pretty low. Very big companies die stupidly because they don't see the older startups uh, coming around until it's, the startups are big and funded uh, $50 million here, $100 million there. When actually the employees, the frontline employees know about those companies, but the boss don't want to hear about it because it's disrupting its uh, fat cat uh, comfort. Uh, yeah. When you don't run a company this way, or when you don't run your household this way, um, the level, I mean, the uncertainty is actually a way to continue to have more knowledge. It's definitely associated with a sort of what I call a growth mindset. Okay. Mm-hmm. The and if, <sighs> yeah? if you're, I, I'm just, the word, um, instability just popped into my head because I realized that as long as you are surrounded by people that you trust to bring forward concerns and to address things as they come up and be proactive and and spontaneous in addressing issues, then as much uncertainty as exists, which it is always, life is always uncertain. You can be confident that the uncertainty is manageable where instability is when you don't have, you haven't surrounded yourself with those people that have the knowledge. Yes, or are afraid. Uh, Confidence or, to be able to address it. Yeah, or also have such a fixed mindset that they discard all the signs of instability. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. But in a way, uh, living, I mean, you have your sense of freedom not, when not everything is determined, okay? If everything was fixed, predetermined, with no risk, quote, uh, quote between quotes, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, we would have no freedom, okay? We'd just be automaton and robots. Um, when you are a human being you, being, you want to be able to choose, okay? Are you going to go out? And, well, there's a chance of rain, but you still want to go out. And what happens if you are wet? That's okay. Right. (laughs) Well, there are some risks we're we're willing to take. And And so there is always um, what I think I was good at teaching my employees is um, them being comfortable with uncertainty, uh, because the uncertainty was shared, okay, and then we would find for solutions. 
And what uh, two researchers, two professors from the Tel Aviv University, from Tel Aviv recently created the, the notion of living, the ability to live with incongruence. Uh, and they call this the A integration. And it's uh, defined by the human ability to bear cognitive and emotional complexity, to bear with that, and to have the, to be able to live with inconsistencies, contradictions, paradox, and not feel strained or uncomfortable. And if more people were realize that living with incongruence is what we actually do, then they say, well, let's embrace it, okay? Right. Well, to some extent, we as human beings have to have, I, I would imagine that that would be kind of on a spectrum, that there are very few people on one end or the other in that ability to live with incongruence. Because some people are more, can tolerate it more than others, but to some extent, we all have to tolerate it. Yes, and I think we tolerate it better if we are surrounded that pe with people who also tolerate it. Okay. Right, and who can help us create a foundation of stability yes. despite, despite the uncertainty. I don't know if it's creation of uh, the foundation, it's creation of forward-thinking solutions. <laughs> Okay. Okay. To build I, I, the edifice rather than con f the foundations. Continue right. to build. So I'm always thinking in terms of practical um, strategies for people to address things like risk and, and, and um, inconsistency and uncertainty. And um, I think one of the major themes that we've come up with so far in this conversation is simply surrounding yourself with people that you trust to see the the inconsistency and uncertainty and to have the the mindset and ability and desire yes desire exactly. to, yeah i think desire is an important yeah. aspect of it yeah. to help and to be there and you have to surround yourself with that support yeah. system and find solutions yes exactly and it that comes right to a very specific time in my life when I did take a risk and it felt like I was taking a risk. Um, and it was the first no longer virtual conference. It was three years ago. Yeah. And I was getting ready to sign a contract with the Ritz Carlton in downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And this contract included a room block, a minimum food and beverage and, um, AV, you know, it was, it was a sizable contract. And the biggest risk in signing it was that my family could lose a lot of money. And it was because there's, um, if you, if you have a certain number of rooms in a room block mm -hmm. and you, you are holding those rooms for your guests and they don't fill that room block, you have, a, you have a little bit of wiggle room, but basically if you don't hit your mark, then you have to pay for those rooms that haven't been reserved. So even at a low rate of 169 a night, you add the 8.9% sales tax onto that and the local tax, and you end up at you know 185 a night. And so I, I realized that this yeah. was a big financial risk that we were taking. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just going to impact me. It was, it was my family. And um, I started to talk to my husband about it. I said, I'm a little concerned about this and I need I need to know that you're on board. I don't want to sign this without absolutely being sure that you are supportive and understand the risk that we are taking as a family. And he said, let's go have coffee. So we actually went down to a coffee shop in downtown Helena and sat together at a table outside. This was in August of 2016. And we had a business conversation. And he asked me really specific questions. He's the kind of person that really thinks through what are the obstacles you're going to face? Yeah. What are the solutions that you have for those obstacles? And, and I don't think things through that, that deeply. I, I, I'm an activator. I just, you know, if I decide I'm going to do something, I'm very strategic in doing it, but I don't necessarily think through the risk like I did in this case. Mm -hmm. 
And he, we're sitting at this table and it, it makes my eyes tear up when I think about how he responded to that. He said, do you believe in this? Is this important to you? Do you feel like this is an investment in you and your career and your future? Yeah. And, so and I said, yes. A calculation and analysis of the circumstances, basically based on knowledge. <laughs> yes. He said, do you trust yourself? I trust you but I need to know that you trust yourself that you're going to be able to make this happen and not have us lose a lot of money. He said, do you, do you believe that you're going to be able to make this happen? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, then I believe it too. Yeah. And, and now the rest is history. We just finished the third conference and um, yeah. we, we didn't lose our shirts <laughs> on that first no longer virtual, which was thank goodness. But I, I remember this so vividly sitting at that table outside of this little coffee shop on a summer day and having this business conversation with somebody who absolutely supported me and understood what the, the, the seriousness of this thing that we were undertaking together, but it was really up to me to make it a success. Yeah. And, and probably thanks to your husband, you realize that the financial commitment was not so tragic, even if you were to lose money. Right. Okay. Yes. And, okay. and kind of thinking in terms of the limit to how much I would lose. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. when you don't think of it, you think of risk in general, you don't say, okay, I need 50 people. I may not have 50 people, but maybe I will have 35. So my loss is not going to be, $200 multiplied by 50. Is going right. To yeah, the first thought is, that's $12,000. I can't afford $12,000. But that's, that's not what's going to happen. I mean, that's worst case scenario. It, exactly. it, it seems very unlikely. Yes. So, uh, and it's good to have people uh, who force us, I mean, uh, to basically go through the entanglement of uh, causes, relationship between things, uh, mm -hmm. additional knowledge that we don't have. And then we, the risk itself, the danger itself uh, melts away f f much faster. And it all has to do with, in fact, using our brain. Because usually when we are afraid, we only use a portion of our brain. <laughs> Right. <laughs> the reptilian portion. Yeah. So basically, we stop thinking. You know, fear is, uh, is a very strong inhibitor. Right. And, um, and when my employees were afraid of something, um, I realized that it, the problem was not the thing to do. It was, had more to do with their own personal confidence uh, trust in their environment of something which or uh, empowerment feeling empowered it was it was not linked to the thing to achieve it was more like am i able to do it okay. it sounds like you have something specific in your head uh, uh very often you know when we would uh, design a project, uh, we would organize the project uh, so that each team would have visibility on the part of the project they were in charge and had visibility for the entirety of the project to have the sense of meaning of what they were doing. But very quickly, I would check if basically um, a group felt that they had visibility upstream and downstream. And sometimes they didn't have because one of the groups was, was too late, for example. It means mm -hmm. that the project had to be redefined. And so the teams were, uh, the people for whom, who were late were losing confidence and right. thought that, there was a big risk that we would not be able to ship at the uh, announced date. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I had to, to diffuse the issue. I said, you know what? If we're not ready at the date we gave, we are going to ship later and give another date. Okay? <laughs> exactly. 
because when you do uh, so software, you're usually selling bugs and delivering late. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has an ambitious timeline, so I guess that makes mm -hmm. sense. And, and if you feel like you're so tied to that deadline that you are stressing out and fearful of missing it, yeah. you're definitely going to miss it. Yes, you miss it. And basically, you, you are so tired, okay? Right. You are threatened by burnout. So you are basically sure not to go for the project or you reach a plateau because fear also prevent, prevents people from being creative and right. imaginative when they, when they have a problem. So I was always working on the, um, the context. Uh, we always think of the things to do when in reality it's so important to um, to work on the psychological context that enable that enables people to operate. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yes, yes, that we're so focused on the task at hand, we're not paying attention to the emotional context of the people who are supposed to accomplish that task. Exactly. And also, I mean, in many cases, people were stressed out or felt there was a risk if I had forgotten to be transparent about where the other teams were, okay, of what, what the exact goal was. Uh -huh. uh, Communication breakdown. Yes. Uh, the feeling that things are not going well is often linked to lack of transparency. And so you have two levels of uncertainty. You have the uncertainty because there is a knowledge that uh, is accessible, but that you don't give to people. And there is the actual uncertainty, okay? A company right. that, who comes up with, with a new feature that you have to integrate before you ship, okay? Uh, yeah, and you exponentially increase the risk Yes. Of, of not completing your task on time. Exactly. And you have the combination of those two. Exactly. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to address uncertainty uh, linked to a knowledge that is available but that you do not convey. Okay. Right. And so when, and then when you crowdsource the real uncertainties uh, coming from the outside, then you are able to catch the information as quickly as possible and basically have a task force addressing it and people are reassured. You know, you could even apply this to family dynamics. Yes, I agree. In terms of that transparency and the uncertainty. Because you, your family, there's always uncertainty in your family. You, you're not guaranteed tomorrow you're there you could lose your job the next day your house could burn down i mean there's there's all kinds of underlying yes. uncertainty yes and and as long as you're transparent you're continuing that communication among your family members then you are all in it together and everyone knows what the uncertainty is yes as opposed to like if you have one person that does all the financial work in the household and doesn't share where you are as a family financially with the others in the household yeah. then that person is holding, not only is they're holding a stressor yes. all to themselves and not sharing it, and so probably doing damage, emotional damage to themselves, but it also may contribute to the lack of transparency and uncertainty in the household if yes. others in the household actually want to know yes. the status of your finances. Yeah, and, and actually, you give a very, very good example here at the uh, personal level, because this is what you say is exactly true for companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies which are financially stressed, and if the CEO or the VP of finance, but the, I mean, ultimately the CEO, doesn't give the status, the, the, just the state of affair, then all the employees are afraid, they're gossiping, they are kind of, a, there's a sort of, a, uh, psychosis rolling through the company and right. everybody is inefficient. Um, it becomes almost sabotage. It's, it's sabotages because it, it mm -hmm. really undermines the energy of everybody. 
And so I did quite a few turnarounds of companies in my life. And what uh, I always did was to share the exact financial situation of the company uh, with all the employees. And you would believe that this would be a reason for employees to leave. That's right. not true. <laughs> they just want to know. They want to know. And they know if there is a point where really there is no hope for them to get their full salary, for example. And it's very clear. And in practice, very people, very few people uh, leave the jump, uh, jump ship. Okay, you have well, more because people jumping ship that they don't know than when they know. Right. Well, I think about it in terms of they want to be part of the solution. Yes. If they believe you and you're being transparent and upfront about things and yes. you're including their voices in what can happen, what the possibilities, I, I can imagine that I, I would stay. I, yeah. Yeah, I well, would not stay with uncertainty that wasn't being shared with me. Well, you're restored when you, when you share knowledge. You restore a sense of personal control, of personal agency. Over and trust. And trust, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, you enable people to experience the flow. And uh, in fact, I never liked the notion of risk-taking and you know, all this cavalcade, cavalcade of words and carnival of words, uh -huh. about, you know, glorification of risk-taking. I was always attentive to make sure that employees would have the experience of flow, uh, they would concentrate on the present moment, leading them to the next moment, that they will merge awareness and action, okay? And they would have a continuous sense of personal control and agency. I'm paraphrasing what the definition of flow is uh, okay. by uh, the specialists, right? Right. And then the activity becomes intrinsically rewarding and people want to continue. They have this intrinsic motivation. And when there is an obstacle, they embrace the obstacle um, instead of being terrified by the obstacle mm -hmm. or more, even better, they go around the obstacle because who says that there is a straight line uh, to, for people <laughs> right. to be? I mean, the, the talent of people, the art of living, is the art of having detours and right. the, the ability to make detours. And so having the experience of the flow when you work gives you the ability to follow several streams of thoughts at once mm -hmm. in a very harmonious fashion. Does it make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I remember getting into flow state once in a while when I was working, especially when I was doing facilitation of groups. Mm -hmm. it, that may not seem like an activity that you could get into flow, but I, could, I would get into flow because I would be um, navigating the, the dynamics of the group yes. and coming up with consensus and agreement and I, I remember vividly because when the meeting would end, I would have this letdown, like, ah, oh. I was exhausted, but at the same time, it was kind of sad to end it because I knew, I knew I had been in that state. Yeah, and this is exactly right. I mean, you have this ability to have a, a multidimensional perception of the environment if you're on the flow. Okay, multidimensional perception of the environment. I love that. That, that sounds, okay, that sounds like something I, I'm going to have to dig into a little bit. Okay. And so basically for me, when um, an employee would come and have any fear, I would try to restore a sense of self, a sense, a sense of uh, personal agency, and sometimes redefine the work they had to do. Because okay? when uh, you are too used to a task, you cannot have this sense of flow you cannot even see the new obstacles 
because you don't think of it. I mean, it, you are outside the, the reality of work. There is yes, no they, I understand. Right. They call that the hidden brain when you're just in, in your routine. and yes, automatic mode. Right, exactly. Like when you're driving the same route to work every day. Yeah, and you don't, okay. uh, you don't even remember that somebody was uh, on the street. Uh, right. And uh, unless there was a big accident. Right, or somebody tries to wave at you, but you're so far into your own head yeah. that you don't even see it because it, you see you're it. not expecting to see it, so you don't yes. see it. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, so you would have to redirect an employee Yes. To, to find a different way to accomplish the goal, to yeah. get from point A to point B. Yes. And so, so that they'd be more thoughtful about it. Yes. Yeah. Basically, it's, it was always the idea to reconnect the task with the person. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always a reconnection. Hmm. So they have some ownership of it. Yes. And... And the feeling that it's coming from them, okay? The feeling that it is, and uh, I mean, especially, uh, what's the English word? I mean, I know the English word, the autotelic experience, but uh, okay, having within oneself a purpose, yes. <laughs> right, and a capacity. I think you have to remind them that they have the capacity to accomplish it. That's true but it has to be a given that people can learn. Okay. Right. <laughs> you have to make that first assumption. <laughs> yes. They can learn. I would so. say that. I would say <laughs> ignorance is the biggest risk. And refuse, uh, I mean, the inability to learn, the uh, refusing that people would learn is what is risky more than right. anything else. And you see that a lot in uh, teachers who get burned out and they take one look at a student and they just make certain assumptions that this kid is not going to amount to anything. So I'm not going to waste my time on him. Oh yes. I mean, but do you, you see, see that a lot? Oh yes. And it's total abomination. Yeah. Right. I, it's I, I devastating would... to the student for sure. Yeah. And, and the, the other students around them because they see it. It's not like your, your teacher's pet doesn't notice that you're dismissing everything having to do with the other student in the room. It impacts the entire culture of the classroom. Yes, but it definitely impacts. Well, your story reminds me of actually a story I had as a professor of philosophy. There was a guy who was like borderline a thief, kind of uh, robbing cars. I mean, it was in the suburb of Paris. He was really a strange cookie, okay? It was... Uh, he, <laughs> If this, uh, his father had not been a cop, he would have been in a, uh, uh, in a center for youth, delinquent youth. I mean, he was, okay. he was really something. And he was doing nothing. He was obnoxious. And, but I would just ignore when he was not obnoxious. And in fact, the, the fact that I ignored him for being obnoxious, he came at the end of the quarter to me, he said, well, you know, I would like to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was really, I mean, the guy was regularly an F, okay? Uh -huh. uh, and so instead of, he, he came to me and said, well, you're going to laugh at me. Uh, I want to become a teacher. I said, okay, why not? And they said, well, but I'm an ignorant. I have never worked. Uh, and uh, have gone from class to class with F, okay? <laughs> and so I, he asked me to give him a program because he was illiterate. He didn't know which century uh, Victor Hugo was, for example. It gives you an idea. Okay. A French person, and um, not to know this was, you know, he knew nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> So uh, for the um, winter vacation, I gave him a I gave him a full program of things to read, and uh, he started to work to participate very more constructively in the class. And you know, at the end of the uh, second quarter, he was regularly having a sort of a C, which was much better than the math. Okay. Of course, yeah. So at each quarter, the guy was improving enormously. 
But when at the second quarter, there was the meeting of the teachers and the parents and the, and so all the other teachers hated that guy because he had a bad reputation in the school. Right. And they had noticed that he had better grades. And so the reaction was, he's cheating. What does he do? What does he do to cheat? So he could not accept that somebody would just like rebuild oneself quickly. Mm-hmm. And he had, I mean, he, he finished the, um, the, the, the year very well. I mean, he was to a corona for B minus, okay? Wow, coming from an F to a B is <laughs> yes. That's yes. a big difference. And five years later, he was a teacher, okay? He's oh. a teacher. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> and... But I had to fight with my colleagues because they had been so fed up with him over the years in different classes that in high school that Mm -hmm. they could not accept the idea that his life had taken a turn uh, simply because I trusted he could do it. Because my assumption, and actually... This is what I told him, you know, if you're so skilled at stealing, at stealing things in cars, it's no more difficult to study philosophy. <laughs> if you can steal things from cars and not get caught, you obviously have some level of skill <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and strategic thinking. <laughs> yes. And the reality is that, that if you box people in one category, this guy is a thief and is going to stay a thief. And the guy had, was 18. Uh, he would have probably uh, be in prison or maybe dead dealing drugs by now. Right. Um, but it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes to, to fight teachers with a fixed mindset. Right. That's, that's really the, the key of the story. And the same fashion, it's managers with a fixed mindset saying, well, this is not, he's not a good fit for that job. Come on, okay? Come on. Right, Um, right. It's very rare um, that people cannot learn something. Usually they cannot learn because they don't don't want to learn and or this is not what they desire. Right, the topic isn't interesting to them. Exactly, exactly. So coming back to some of these ideas and bringing it back to strategies for people to use. You know, our first one was making sure you're surrounding yourself with a person or people who can address that, um, the, the potential risks with you, who support you, that can help you address any obstacles that you think might come up. Being transparent about what those concerns are yes. so that you can not be as afraid of them Mm -hmm. I would say another one would be to address whatever fear you have about what you're perceiving as risk and really figure out what is, what are you really afraid of and how, how likely are those things that you're afraid of to happen? Yes. It's the first, the knowledge of the Mm -hmm. component, okay. Decompose Mm -hmm. the danger into what would build the alleged danger and then right. examine the probabilities of bad things to happen. Okay? Right. Knowing that a high probability that something will happen does not make it happen. We know this from the elections, okay? Right. Uh, and that a low probability that something will not happen does not annihilate the possibility it would happen. Right. Uh, but then it gives a, a f- mental flexibility. Right. Uh, so that would lead into another strategy is to make sure that you have a growth mindset to make sure that when you think about this in terms of risk, that you are thinking in terms of flexibility and the potential for the next thing. And and knowing that whatever you're doing, you may end up pivoting towards something else. Exactly. This isn't like the end result. This isn't this isn't an end game. This is a, a long game and yes. kind of never ending really when it comes to yeah. innovation and risk. Yes. And it's not a linear game. Right. Okay. <laughs> Boy, do I know that. Okay. <laughs> and 
uh, you have to, to believe in the detours of serendipity. Oh, I love that you brought that up. Okay. Um, which is the, the randomness of how we learn things and how we find solutions. You have uh, to accept chaos because where there is no chaos, there is no ability to just infiltrate to create something <laughs> anyway. Right. Okay. Right. So the, don't forget the etymology of the word chaos. Okay. Um, so it's, um, it's a gaping void that calls for you to act. <laughs> uh, and if you don't have that gaping void, you end up in that stability and, and a yes, sixth and, mindset. Yes, and then you become apathetic. Right. So by synchronicity, you're talking, and this comes back to that whole idea of keeping flexible and having that growth mindset, yeah. is um, being open to the, the opportunities, sometimes that come with breaking things, um, but opportunities that come to you in ways that you might not have expected them yes. and, and making a conscious decision about whether to take that opportunity and, and make it part of your, whatever it is that you're trying to do in terms of taking risk. Yeah. Making it a conscious uh, decision or mm -hmm. not conscious at all. <laughs> right. Well, because you never know what's going to fall know. into your lap. Like, for instance, um, I, I didn't realize that as soon as I would get my MBA, that a certain job would plot, somebody would specifically ask me to apply for a job. I, I was just doing the MBA because I knew I wanted to learn more. I wanted the advanced degree. It was really more about going back to school and, and learning again in that kind of environment. But I, I didn't know. It was kind of synchronicity because that person that reached out to me to apply for the job said, I don't know if you have an MBA, but if you do, this would be a perfect job for you. Yeah. So she believed in uh, the ability to adjust, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. synchronicity, the yeah. timing, timing and is the just timing, amazing. But, yeah. The timing. Right. But if anybody had told me when I finished my doctorate in philosophy, being a specialist, a specialist of John Locke, that I would create... <laughs> A database company less than 10 years later, after writing on the history of perfume and fashion, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is like totally unplanned. <laughs> I love that you've taken so many turns. And again, it's partly because you value synchronicity. You value it. When it pops into your vision, you're like, oh, I can apply everything that I've learned over the past 10 years and all these other jobs to what is dropping into my lap right now. That's perfect. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's true. It's, uh, I mean, the way you rationalize it is, uh, I agree, but <laughs> <laughs> it never came. And I was teaching philosophy and history of sciences when I thought that I could speak and conceptualize everything, but I had not seen anything. You know, I was 25. And so I felt the hole and I decided that I, I realized that I could speak of nature, uh, but I could not describe a tree or a rose. And <sighs> I, felt, I felt like, you know, kind of moving brain only. Okay. And I said, well, I'm going to do something that forces me to describe stuff. So I, I chose the fashion industry because fashion is about details. Right. So, uh, you know, when you have to describe a collection from a couture collection, you have better be able to see uh, details quickly, to tell a story quickly, and uh, be read by demanding uh, readers. Because mm -hmm. I was writing uh, for major magazines. And so from there, I, real I wrote books on the history of fashion, at the same time, I was still teaching philosophy. Uh, but working in fashion, I thought that even though perfumery had a different pace, it was key for the perception of the, of the environment. So I studied the history of perfume, and while I was working on history of perfume, I needed 
to organize the, the gigantic amount of data I had collected on, on fragrances, on the history of advertising uh, for basically five or 6,000 perfumes. And I needed, wow. a, I needed a database. And so I looked at was, what was available and I thought it was pathetic and, and you know, nobody could use that. And I couldn't use it. So that's how I started the database company on the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> and of course, I didn't have time anymore to uh, teach philosophy, write on the fashion and fragrance industry, write books. Uh, but it was really present in me. Mm-hmm. And I think all of this gave me a deeper perception of my employees Instead of uh, looking at my employees as robots who were supposed to accomplish tasks, I look at them as people. A lot of the women employees I had were very happy to ask me my opinion about their makeup. And I was happy to give it to them. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. <laughs> well, you were a fashion writer for a long time. It's great yeah. to have that kind of resource. It's, it, it all comes back to knowing your resources. Who, who do I ask for what? And what do I have internally that I can rely yeah. on? But to, to come back to your synchronicity, that's why I speak of a flow that guides me through the meanders of opportunities. You know? <laughs> Probabilities and possibilities. Yes, exactly. exactly. Oh, I love that. This yeah. has been such a treat. I'm, I'm so glad we took the time to do this. Thank you for sharing your stories and your thoughts about so many different topics, but particularly the fact that you don't see risk as necessarily risk. I mean, it, it's different between jumping out of an airplane for skydiving versus choosing to start a company. I hate when, you know, this uh, training courses to become a leader when they give you as an exercise skydiving, for me, it's like I'm totally allergic to this kind of reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> when you skydive, you are virtually almost unconscious. So is the ability to address risk or complexity by just falling into the void? Come on. It's <laughs> awesome. Right. That's not a, a good strategy. <laughs> no, I, mean, I would recommend uh, to... Uh, for me, a better way to be able to address complex situations is to develop combinatorial capabilities by, for example, listening to music. Okay? Because music, especially orchestral music, is definitely ergogenic. Okay? And it opens up mental space. Hmm. That's why also very often I ask my employees if they were musicians. <laughs> Which you know resonates with me, and I use the word yeah, I know, I know, I know. for <laughs> specific reason. <laughs> but what, what, uh, what I notice is that music increases the uh, emotional uh, and cognitive capabilities and flexibilities. So th- there are uh, not too many research on the topic but um, the motivational aspect of music and building up uh, confidence is incre- starts to be analyzed. And it was analyzed actually by, by psychologists of the uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, empirical aesthetics. And so it's usually, they, they look at it from, uh, you know, mot- motivational of, uh, motivation of uh, athletes, uh, like uh, anthems, those kind of things. But this is true in companies. So the more you open up the music field in companies, the more you have a chance to um, open up the mental space of employees. The, I think there was a, this article, um, I haven't checked on it for a long time. Uh, I mean, it's I think the article came out three or four years ago, and it was called The Sound of Success. I'll have to look that up and see if I can um, put a link to the, that article in the blog post. And, and so the, the way to address difficult situation is not to be a risk taker. 
is to be hyper analytical and uh, be able to compute several musical lines, complex melodies and harmonies. So it's really more about being curious and opening your mind than yeah. it is about risk taking. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Of course, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, um, just for the sake of our listeners, I will have some uh, information about Marilene and her history um, in the blog post associated with this podcast. I'll also have a link to her LinkedIn so that you can connect with her and learn more about what she does. And I will try to also have some links to some of the things we talked about today, like um, the the, the Plato book, um, yes. The Republic, and yes. a few excerpts from that that you were mentioning, yes. and uh, maybe some of the music that you like to listen to. Uh, one of the links that you suggested to me earlier today when we had a different conversation, I'll definitely include that because I, I loved that French composer. I hadn't actually listened to him in many years, so I'll probably <laughs> include a link to that too. Um, <laughs> So anyone who wants to reach out to, to Marilyn, please um, go ahead and click on her LinkedIn uh, link that I'll have on the blog post and say hello. Yeah. Uh, in the music, as I think of it, um, maybe you can, we can, we can select also music which is familiar for people like uh, the uh, Space Odyssey music, for example. Yes. Okay. Which I played when I gave at creative conferences. I have used it. But and this is basically a big piece of uh, Strauss, also Sprach Zarathustra. Okay, mm -hmm. the same thing with um, you know if you the music of the um, the Empire Strikes Back is a great love that <laughs> by John Williams. Okay, and mm -hmm. this is where you find out that classical music has a very very strong power. And this morning, true, I, I spoke about. Uh, um, a piece by a piece of opera sung by Callas. Okay, and my employees, I say, are you crazy? And guess, guess what? Everybody wanted to know what it was, because yes. it was you know we were announcing new products, and it was the whole context where they they kind of accepted all the new products. So basically, they were it ready. Okay? It touched them. It touched them. Just them, and and the, it was. The new features were, were put in a global context of a new mental space. Oh. Okay. Wow. That's terrific. Yes, we will definitely include some links to some of the music you mentioned just now. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to actually pulling them and listening to them before I okay. publish that blog post. So thank you again, and um, we will be in touch. Okay, thank you so, so much for your fantastic questions. Thank you for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Share Them Will. Please visit my website for more podcast episodes, blog posts, and information about how I can help you develop and share your stories at elkinsconsulting.com. Could you tell me that you're going away?